So welcome folks um, and good afternoon from here or good morning or good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our third meeting of our first seminar. Um, we are so, so lucky to have Dr. Lara Shihai, who I'll properly introduce in just a minute. Um, and, uh, but I wanna just go over some of the shaping of, of how we're going to proceed. So we're gonna follow a version of the same process we had the last two times, both with uh, Dr. Moss and Dr. Fishin, um, but with a small difference as follows. So if you, I'll repeat it after we hear from Dr. Shihai as well, um, as people are still coming in. But so we'll hear from Lara for about 20 or so minutes about the two texts uh, that we read for today uh, from Fanon. And then we will go directly to questions from Dr. Shihai and for Dr. Shihai about the presentation, at which point we'll take a five minute break, which will allow folks to do whatever they have to do. But if you're staying for breakout rooms, that's great. And if you're leaving, please leave at that time. During that break, Michelle O'Brien uh, will put folks into the appropriate breakout groups, and then we will we will offer that invitation, and so then you will accept it at the end of that five minutes. And those those the last thing I'll say is that those invitations expire. So if you miss it, Michelle O'Brien will be in the room and happy to help you get into your breakout group. Um, okay, so thank you in advance to Michelle for all the awesome tech work of this. So it is my just total honor and pleasure and exciting duty to welcome and introduce Dr. Lara Shihai, uh, who is a PsyD and a faculty member at the George Washington University Professional Psychology Program. Her work is broadly on decolonial struggles, as well as power and race and gender constructs and dynamics within and also beyond psychoanalysis, both what might be meant by applied psychoanalysis and in the clinic. Um, last year saw the release of her fantastic co-authored book uh, with Stephen Shihai, uh, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, Theory and Practice in Palestine, which came out from Rutledge. And I will drop a link to the book so that you can see it if you haven't read it. I very much encourage you to do so. Uh, she is also the author of many other writings and also many other kinds of contribution beyond uh, psychoanalytic clinical writing as well. And I will put some of those links in the chat as well. Laura is the former secretary of the Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology uh, and the incoming president of Division 39 uh, at the American uh, Psychological Association, as well as on many committees shaping the future, a, be a better future for 21st century psychoanalysis, both in the US context and, and far beyond. And we're so lucky for that as well. And also has worked at JAPA, at Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society, a fantastic journal and um, is a contributing editor at Parapraxis Magazine. So uh, we're so lucky to hear from Lara, who plays a really vital and central role in shifting the conceptions of the social in psychoanalysis in and well beyond the clinic as well. So we'll now turn to Dr. Lara Shihai. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. What a generous introduction. Thank you to everybody, especially Parapraxis and everybody who made today possible, including all the invisible labor that sometimes gets lost along the way. Um, so just a, a big thank you and a shout out to everybody. Um, I wanna start off with a land acknowledgement and I do this always, I'm on the stolen and, and occupied land of the Massachusetts people currently, but I especially do this when I'm speaking about Fanon. Um, and today I'm doing it also with a recognition that land acknowledgements, of course, are a starting point and um, sovereignty, self-determination, land back efforts and disrupting settler colonial logics are the central focus when we do land acknowledgements, which is intimately tied up with the question of the family and its abolishment, whether in Algeria, in Palestine, or Turtle Island. Um, here, I learned from indigenous scholar, Kim Talbert and Scott Morganson, who bring our attention to settler colonial sexuality 
and gender relations as colonial configurations of kinship and gender sexual positioning that are fortified by the state, religion, schools, and science in their words. So a land acknowledgement includes all of that for me today. Um, so I will be, I have the beautiful task of taking up Fanon today, and I'm so grateful for you all for extending this invitation. Uh, I get very excited when I talk about Fanon, um, anything Fanon related. If any of you who know me, when I talk about Fanon, I just light up. So please feel free to stop me if I'm talking too quickly, if I appear hypomanic <laughs> or in any one of these ways, please feel free to just um, put a hand up and stop me or take note and then we'll come back to it in questions um, in Q&A, of course, as well. And I welcome all of that. Um, usually in a smaller group, I have the opportunity to ask folks where they are in time and space, which feels very important, especially when we're taking up Fanon. I, I don't get to do that today because we're such a big group and I want to do justice to this work. Um, but just quickly, and I no shame involved anything, a show of hands or Zoom hands about who had read Fanon prior to this. Um, wonderful. Okay. Oh, this is so exciting. All right, wonderful. That makes me so happy. And it partially makes me happy because uh, Fanon in psychoanalysis is so underrepresented. Um, so this is such a wonderful treat to talk to you all. So, and I feel so excited that I will be learning from you all uh, as well in the discussion. So um, please uh, feel free, I invite you to bring in everything that you know about Fanon and it'll be for the betterment and enrichment of our process also in the discussion and in the small groups. Um, and just a word that I will be focusing, hyper-focused on Fanon today, but I also want to note that's not to the exclusion of all the wonderful work that's being done now, especially about rethinking about families and, and sort of queer ideas about thinking about families. It's not to the exclusion of that. It's just a hyper-focus on Fanon today and hopefully to extrapolate um, the ways in which Fanon offers us an entry point into that. Okay. Uh, it's it's really hard for me to pick a favorite piece by Fanon, and perhaps uh, part of that process. And I'm I was so it's so lovely. I was telling Hannah yesterday. I got to see her that this process of rereading Fanon also parallels what for the past five years I've been really immersing myself in regarding abolitionist futures and possibilities. So in reading and in thinking in an abolitionist way, what is made anew every time? And what are the conditions that create new possibilities that push past the foreclosures of normativity? And for me, there's no greater sight of the abolitionist practice than the family, right? A structure and relational matrix that has the ability to enshrine what Sylvia Winter's concept of the universal human, uh, right, white, cis, hetero, and at the same time, the potential to pathologize the will to create, to build as we dismantle, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore would say, futures. So that is a lot of what I'll be focusing on today. I think we can see a parallel process of this in the readings for today, right? So Black Skin, White Masks is, a, is coming out of Fanon's earliest writing, what was his dissertation that at the time was too radical for the academy and the medical establishment before his own militancy in the Jabhat Tahrir al-Watani or the Front de Libération Nationale, the FLN, right? In this way, with these readings, we see an in vivo radicalization, a bursting through of imaginaries, a restructuring of the logics of Fanon's world before our very eyes when we read these things together. And movingly, we also see in the unrelenting beauty of Fanon, how intimately woven racism, racial hierarchy, and what we would now call racial capitalism from Cedric Robinson and colonialism are all interwoven. In these ways, these readings are complementary. They're a logical extension of each other, a journey we're taken on to Fanon's own experiential question of abolishing the family in service of militancy and revolution, which is the real key in what I'll be focusing on today. 
the overall themes I've sort of organize my thoughts around today, then I'd like for us to hold on to in mind and maybe flesh out a little further in conversation together are what under the umbrella of what I would call decolonial futures of family that sort of emerge from these pieces together. So underneath this umbrella of decolonial futures of the family to think about how dismembering and remembering are linked together and then dissociating and reassociating can be linked together. And I say these things, dismembering, remembering, dissociating, reassociating, both affectively and cognitively, but also as a function of the logics of colonial violence and its effects on the family, and how, of course, race, racialization, and racism are tied up in this. For me, this is how blacks, the, the chapter in Black Skin, White Mass and the chapter in Dying Colonialism are linked. In black skin, white mass, we see the confusion the white gaze creates. And this here is the dismembering, right? The disassociation, a racial dissociation, as David Eng might say. Or, and I've talked about this in other ways as enactments of otherness, when you come to enact the other that you are interpolated as, right? And then in the dying colonialism, what happens when the militant comes into being? organized internally and externally by a revolutionary collective struggle, not an atomized individual in isolation, which is precisely what colonialism intends on doing, atomizing people, making them individuals. Here is where we see a remembering, a reassociation. So we make that movement with him from disassociation and dismembering into remembering and reassociation. There's so much packed into these pages, um, but I want to sort of just sketch out some takeaway points for me in this moment in time. And this is a way that I would say that we can enact a decolonial abolitionist approach even to textual reading. What does it mean to come back to a text and something new arises from that, a new possibility comes into being? And so what I'm saying today hopefully will not be the only thing I take away the next time I come into Fanon, or at the end of today in our knowledge production together and being in community that something else arises from that as well. But in this moment in time and returning to these excerpts from Fanon, here's my sort of takeaway is, my sense is that Fanon is providing us in both these readings a non-essentialist critique of racism and patriarchy and colonialism is the logics within which these thrive and within which these are enshrined. So for example, as I was reading it this time, especially in the context of what's happening today, right? That there's, there's this experience of reading Fanon and having the experience of also living in the world <laughs> that we see today, right? What's happening globally with the rise of fascism and of course, a reinscription of the oppressive forces of patriarchy and how family comes to be the vessel in which that is enacted. So I'm thinking here, of course, attacks on transgender kids and lives as a way to ensure transgender futures cannot come into being, right? An attack on reproductive rights and an attack literally on humans, killing them off anybody who does not constitute a non-pure version of what family should be. One of the amazing things about locating like this is I started to realize that structures of oppression restructure the family life all the time, right? And so we can think about since Engels saying the family has always been the site of social reproduction. And yet what jumps through these pages of Fanon is how the colonized and especially the black person ends up holding responsibility for this. As a, as a really important aside here, which I wanna highlight, in this way, Fanon introduces us to what anti-blackness looks like and how it constitutes all racism, right? In that in relationship to French colonialism, the Algerian Arab comes to be the denigrated subject in a racial hierarchy that's fundamentally structured by anti-Blackness, right? These things can't be un un unlinked. It's only through his experience as a Martinican Black man in Imperial France 
that he's able to create solidarity and see what is actually happening in Algeria. And then he eventually becomes inducted as an honorary Algerian through his militant struggle, right? So that's an aside, but a very important <laughs> aside to the ways we're thinking about these things in a ways about the expanding of possibilities, solidarity of linking up, but also kinship. It's the colonized sort of come back to this point of it's the colonized person and people who contain and hold for humanity and especially the global north, the constitutive essential site of pathologization in relationship to family. And yet, if we accept this essentialist and deterministic racist reading, we'd also miss this important point in both his readings. So for one, Colonialism is a phallocentric process that can only reinforce patriarchy and racism, even in its attempts to castrate the indigenous Arab or black father. It doesn't undo patriarchy, but rather acts as a means to codify patriarchal ma matrices of power. Right. So again, in its attempts to modernize, to create new forms of family, more modern forms of family, all the bullshit that we hear about what colonialism brings, it actually works to codify certain forms of family that are constituted by patriarchal power. This I think is the discursive, discursive seed of civilizational feminism, what Francois Vergès would talk about or what Spivak might say about white women saving brown men, brown women from brown men. This is especially important and again goes back to this point of how does the global south come to hold the pathology of family for the entire world. And this is even more clear because we can see the re reconfiguration of the nuclear family is happening everywhere, especially as Fanon is writing right and especially in the context of the global north where post World War II, the new job of mom is to consume and reproduce as a means of caring for father and kids. Right? She's stuffed back in the home after being in the factory. In the global south, and in Fanon's writing, the Algerian and Black folks are being tasked with holding the primitiveness, fun primitive functioning of patriarchy. Right? It reconstitutes it in the colonial condition, not as a symptom of the colonial condition, but rather as an essential feature of racist sort of thought around the native and the indigenous. These, of course, are the logics of racism and coloniality, which we see highlighted in both these readings in a stunning fashion, in a Fanonian stunning fashion, which is also why the counterforce is so moving to me. Right? Because in these readings across the board, whether it's in black skin, white mass, or later what comes into dying colonialism reading, it's not the magnanimity of white saviors or of liberal white feminism or purple washing operations of imperialism that disrupt patriarchy and by extension, the extractive and confining parameters of the family, but rather, Fanon shows us in piercing clarity that it's the militant and the revolutionary struggle that does this. Right? The militant revolutionary struggle not only disrupts, but also has the potential to overturn patriarchy entirely. And the way he shows us this happens is that when it's just an individualist practice, the structure is not disrupted, but when it becomes a national militant struggle, patriarchy is implicated. Right? In other words, when militancy becomes a social program, it reconfigures the logics of patriarchy and therefore. <laughs> and of course, here I'm thinking about Kwame Nkrumah and Amilcar Cabral. About, and their writings when they're understanding the popular revolution and anti-colonial struggle as a social project in, in Africa. I wanna quote from Fanon here. He says in, in uh, the Algerian family, quote, the family emerges strengthened from this ordeal 
in which colonialism has resorted to every means to break the people's will. I'll repeat that quote. The family emerges strengthened from this ordeal in which colonialism has resorted to every means to break the people's will. So this is not about, his commentary is not about the backwardness of Arabs coming into modernity, right? It's about what it means when you become militant revolutionaries and what it means that militant revolutionaries then connect with a global resistance movement that reconfigures colonialism and patriarchy at the same time and therefore extends to the family. I want to quote again from uh, the Dan uh, from the chapter of Medan colonialism. He says, quote, the freedom of the Algerian people from then on become identified with woman's liberation with her entry into history, end quote. And the way I'm reading this and linking it up with black skin, white mass is this is how his own fragmentation in black skin, white mass can be reinterpreted. In that chapter in black skin, white mass, there's there through the scene of a white woman and her child, that's the site of violence onto the black man, the black body, the black psyche, a site of fixity. He's fixed at that point. Now, later through militancy is transformed into a scene of possibility, right? What once was fixed has now become a scene of possibility. As Fanon becomes a militant himself, the fixedness of the white gaze is also disrupted, right? So when he says this brilliant line that a lot of folks sort of hone in on, and he says in Black Skin White Masks, and I'm quoting here, I am fixed, having adjusted their microtomes, they objectively cut away slices of my reality. I'm laid bare, I feel, I see in those white faces, that it is not a new man who has come in, but a new kind of man, end quote. Rather than deny that, mater that material reality of racism that he's describing for us, it's not like magically that disappears, right? By the time he's writing Dying Colonialism, that white gaze is no longer there. Rather, he instead invites us into an in vivo discovery in the Algerian family through militancy of a disruption of that gaze, a turning inside out of racist patriarchy and racialized masculinity, the only way he could be seen and received initially, that then becomes a feminist revolutionary reading in which he too, as a black man, is liberated. Okay. So this is the quote then from a dying colonialism. This woman who was writing the heroic pages of Algerian history was in so doing bursting the bounds of the narrow world in which she had lived without responsibility and was at the same time participating in the destruction of colonialism and in the birth of a new woman. So in Black Skin White Mass, he's talking about the fashioning of a new man. And in Dying Colonialism, he ends with saying, the destruction of colonialism births also a new woman. And that's the parallel we're seeing here. So his new man becomes the militant new woman. For Fanon and for us to metabolize, to destroy colonialism is to destroy racial hierarchy, is to destroy patriarchy, which are the pillars of the sort of nuclear Oedipal family. And here again, I'm quoting from him in A Dying Colonialism. He says, it was these militant women who constituted the points of reference around which the imagination of Algerian feminine society was to be stirred to the boiling point. And here I wanna sort of return back when at the beginning the, the overarching idea of decolonial possibilities of family, right? Here he's in, inviting us into imaginaries, possibilities that come into being, 
when the boiling over point happens, that that's channeled through a structure and a logic of militant resistance. He says further, the woman for marriage progressively disappeared and gave way to the woman for action. The young girl was replaced by the militant, the woman by the sister. I just want to uh, reiterate that. So I, I feel it. That hit me hard, <laughs> that line, rereading it now, right? The woman for marriage progressively disappeared and gave way to the woman for action. In this part, the young girl was replaced by the militant, the woman by the sister. And the sister, of course, the comrade, the sister in struggle. So, I mean, I could go on forever <laughs> about the ways these things are linked up, but I just, I want us to sort of, lean in together and in and, and sort of tying up to give us time to work with this. That when, when he's saying about the militant action, the woman becoming the sister, the sort of replacement, the reconfiguration of family, right? To, for us to imagine this is beyond ableist notions of action, right? We're not just talking about an ability-based idea about action, but rather his sort of coming into being as a part of an interconnected new social order that he and others actively created and were continuously created, right? Constantly being created and recreated. This is the decolonial possibilities of the family. How do we recreate and create constantly versus the fragmented, the dismembering one, that we see in the white gaze in black skin, white mass, in which we see he felt saddled by, right? The foreclosed possibility, the fixedness of his blackness in that uh, scene is so sharply contrasted by what can be created. And it's not an empty hope either. It's a struggle. It's a struggle through solidarity. What do we, what comes into being as we struggle to imagine a new social order that becomes part of a fabric of a social project that then of course is reproduced and struggled against within the context of the family. And here he reminds us that the intersubjective experience and reality of women in the struggle become as important as being women in the struggle, right? This is what I think brings into being the possibility of a new man, a new human, and a new family for Fanon. These are the possibilities beyond foreclosures, right? The decolonial futures of family that go beyond even what Fanon can imagine in this piece, right? And here I just want to sort of highlight that he's talking about mechanisms, right? Processes. In Black Skin, White Masks, he's talking about how colonial racial capitalism commodifies racialized bodies. And he's doing that by articulating his own affective experience and internal process. He invites us into his internal process of experiencing himself and experiencing the gaze and what that gaze does to him and how that links him up with a larger process and mechanics of commodification and objectification of racialized bodies. The mechanism he talks to us about in dying colonialism is how colonized racial bodies claim their agency, refuse colonial logics, and then own their subjectivity and liberation. So both of the, he takes us through this journey together. When we think about it in that way, as Black feminist scholar Tracy Deneen Sharpley Whiting says, and she has a beautiful reading of feminism and Fanon, right? And Fanon has been sort of critiqued around his lack of feminist reading or his lack of centering of women. And she takes a different approach and she reminds us, he's not speaking for women, nor is he leading us to a foreclosed possibility of what militant revolution means for the family or even denying the forces of patriarchy to recreate dynamics of violence within the struggle and within the family, but rather that he's speaking to a process, a process of reconfiguration of self and family in a relational matrix ensconced 
within colonialism. Okay. This is his version of a decolonial abolitionist future, but in a future he didn't live to see. He didn't live to see the liberation of Algeria. Before I end, I just wanna sort of bring us back to today. And again, I, there's a lot <laughs> packed into there, but I wanna bring us back to today, which is really important to sort of regrounding and why Fanon continues to be so important for our struggles and for our thinking through of colonial logics and racial logics for psychoanalysis and also for the futures we're trying to build together is that it brings us back to today and the theme of this wonderful series. And the question for us to take up further, and I'm, I'd be really interested in hearing some of this in the, in the breakout groups too, is that when we read Fanon, there's a way in sometimes we might get lost in the period of the time he's writing, right? But I wanna sort of, again, I started off by talking about how reading him in today's context brought something new for me. So I wanna end by bringing us back also for today where settler colonialism and colonialism is happening today, right? Here in Turtle Island, but also in Palestine and in Western Sahara, both countries as Arab as Algeria. So it's almost like, you know, my partner and I were talking and it's like everybody loves watching Battle of Algiers, right? And part of it is seeing the empowerment of women and the, the sort of action and the centrality of women in the revolutionary struggle. If we were to sort of bring that back to today, to Palestine, Western Sahara, that, that movie is happening in real time, right? So if we're thinking about it like that, if we're grounding it, not in the abstract, not in a textual reading of Fanon, but in our current understanding of colonialism, of patriarchy, of the family under colonialism, how do we take Fanon's reading of militancy? How do we understand racialized atomization as a central working mechanism of colonialism? How do we understand women's central role in the revolution and in pushing revolutionary futures of family? And how do we understand the family as a primary site of contestation? How do we understand gender as being a part of this and expanding also the, constrict, the constricting categories even he is talking in, right? And then how do we understand a liberation movement to these current struggles? I'm gonna end there because honestly, I could keep talking forever. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So just for folks who are, yeah, I wanna applaud. Um, and you're getting lots, I don't know if you can see, it's the terrible thing about Zoom. It's like only a few, but there are lots of people in, the, um, in their windows. So it's um, my, my pleasure now to ask folks, whoever wants to participate to queue up for questions for Dr. Shihai. Um, if you want to raise your Zoom hand, that will help put you, yeah, exactly, uh, to the front of the queue. Uh, or if you want to write in the chat and either voice it yourself or have me or someone else voice it for you, um, we can go ahead. And yes, it, Mark, if you want to go first, please. Uh, thank you for that. That was, that was really interesting and, and useful. I just wanted to... Um, maybe uh, ask, does Fanon have a normative position on the family? Um, just because it seemed to me while reading the Algerian family that he seems to be celebrating the end of one form of the family, a kind of traditional suspicious peasant form of family and the emergence of a perhaps more flexible, modern, egalitarian family form. But whether he is, whether he takes a normative position on the family as a whole, 
I was kind of less sure. I was wondering what you thought about that. Can you say a little more about what what part of that, like what's the confusing element? What what tripped you up that you couldn't quite wrap your mind around in that? In the text, sorry, you mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure anything tripped me up per se. It's just he just often references the fact that all of these kind of traditional um, suspicious kind of forms of you know ordering family life are kind of ending mm -hmm. um and these new forms are kind of emerging like for example egalitarianism between couples or a less dominant role for the father but it doesn't at least I just from my reading it doesn't seem clear that he's saying that um the family per se should disappear or that's an optimal outcome but rather yeah, what I just said, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate the the clarification. And I think you know, it's a really important question because I think this is also intimately linked up with the fight for self determination, particularly when we have fights right against settler colonialism and when we can extrapolate family to nation state and so on and so forth. Is that in many ways the question becomes a question could be a colonial question of getting rid of kinship ties, right? And what does that mean to, to abolish the family entirely is also getting rid of potentially primary modes of relating to others in kinship, right? And in ways that can be reinvented and renegotiated consistently as part of a revolutionary struggle and as part of a larger social project of uh, liberation. So do I think that he has a sort of I, I idea on family that's sort of fixed? I, I don't think so. I think what he gives us in a dying colonialism is the opportunity to say that people now are taking up a way of reconfiguring what family looks like for them within the context and responding to a national cry for what that needs to look like. Right? And I think that we can imagine, again, we can imagine that that gets reconfigured when a situation gets reconfigured or the structures does. I want to bring a, actually a quote from Wretched of the Earth might be really helpful for this. And in reading this, I'm going back to Wretched of the Earth and saying, okay, what pieces of this are there as well? And he warns, he warns in Wretched of the Earth, he warns of, of and I'm quoting here, the pitfalls of national consciousness, which includes the dangers of perpetuating the feudal tradition, which holds sacred the superiority of the masculine element over the feminine, right? So he's also, the reason why I'm saying this is I don't think he's also um, romanticizing the, what, ha what might happen as a recapitulation of the normativity of the family as part of revolutionary struggle, right? I don't think he gives us that answer in these texts, but he does open it up enough where he's saying these are active agents in creating and pushing up against the contours of what are understood as normative processes. And what he does further, which I think is really helpful and might speak to this normativity, is he doesn't locate it as an essential feature of culture. If these things can be negotiated, he's also resisting that somehow the Arabs or the Algerians are that much more fucked up, right? Or that much more sort of located in the primacy or the structure of hierarchy in the family in this particular, that this is a negotiated process that's constantly. So I suppose in that way, I don't know that he has a fixed normativity. I think he's inviting, what does the, what does the militant bring in? How do roles get reconfigured in that? And we're reading it from a, from a current context and you're reading that and you kind of go, like these, these, the ways that he's talking about things, but it's also a, a really pointed critique of a stereotypical understanding of what a family might look like as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Wendy, if you'd like to, to speak next. Yeah, thanks so much, Laura. Um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, so 
In the interest of creating a through line from the first session where we read about the primal horde um, into our readings for today, I don't mean to presuppose that Fennel was at all a Fordian, but I'm curious to the extent that the dying colonialism text is much more anthropological than the other one, which is more um, has more psychic phenomenological content. Um, whether the successful supersession of the father that he describes by the sons who then become militant brothers does have some sort of psychic component to it that he ever, that, that maybe somewhere else he writes about or that you maybe have thoughts about um, insofar as it is the kind of mythic origin of a, of a certain uh, concept of the relation between um, the child and the authority of, of the father in, in the Freudian tradition, but then um, seems, at least in the context of Algeria, to, uh, to, to actually see a certain kind of realization in the form of, uh, you know, the sons who don't have the same kind of nostalgic attachment to tradition and therefore have to kind of um, uh, indoctrinate the father rather than the other way around. And so I'm, I'm just curious if, if, um, there's a kind of, maybe it's not, um, Gill or, or the sort of affects that Freud assigns to the, to the, you know, um, relation between the sons and the father and the primal horde myth, but if there is any kind of psychic component, um, to the experience of, of the sons, and in some case, the daughters as well, um, superseding, uh, the authority of the father in, in the context of, revolution and and kind of militant um uh relation to colonialism yeah thank you for that what a great question i have i i have a two-part answer to that one of which i'm I'll, I'll sort of root in dying colonialism chapter and then the other one about what he did clinically which helps us also see some of the ways that he's thinking about this psychically and how it plays out right um so I would think about in his, you know, in the hierarchy piece is that I, we don't get a sense of guilt from the, from children in general, I don't say children across the board, because there's a way in which the struggle, that's why I wanted to focus on militancy. There's a way in which then the struggle for liberation comes to take precedence over everything. So it restructures also what hierarchy means. And there is no more a hierarchy of father and son, there is a setting of an example where the son might be the one to lead the father to that position, right? Or the daughter to lead the father to the position of like, um, uh, of body sovereignty, right? But what the militant struggle does is reconfigure hierarchy entirely. And we get a sense of what it means like a non-hierarchical struggle within that, right? Where the larger a uh, cause that people are galvanized around and then perhaps reorganize psychically, right? If there's a restructuring psychically is to restructure what is the cause that we're sort of actively working towards. Now, what's brilliant about the Dan colonialism piece is he sort of mentions the psychic processes that are happening internally, just like he does in Black Skin, White Mask, but in a different way, collectively. He's like, part of what happens in the father's mind is now he's making a calculation, right? He's going, what the fuck kind of asshole would I be if I'm sitting there asking my daughter about who she's, you know, who she is re in relationship with when I have a larger struggle to fight for? Like I, I emerge as the asshole here that doesn't understand what we're doing, right? So perhaps the shame and the guilt is a self-shame and the guilt a recognition of who we are as individuals in relationship to a collective. And that restructures also psychically the family, right? It no longer is the father at the head. It's sort of saying, how do we re-understand what our positions are, right? And it becomes a sort of maybe a, a horizontal understanding of this in service of a larger cause. The only way to do that is through militancy, right? He's very clear about this. <laughs> Right, because he says, once all options have been worked through, you do this through voting, you do this through all this, right? He says, he's like, and then you take up arms because this is the only way to really do this. 
And so perhaps we can think about like the, the colonizers, the settler colonizers as well, as the betray the, you're betraying the father, you're betraying the authority. There's no guilt in that. There's no guilt in that because they understand who's indigenous and who's the settler, right? And in fact, there is no comment, there's incommensurability between indigenous life and settler life. So there's no guilt in sort of saying, okay, let's write this. And that's, that goes back to wretched of the earth, making everything right, putting it back in its place. That's what the part of decolonization, right? The part of his clinical practice that I think is really helpful. So when freedom and alienation came out as the translation of his clinical works, which we got to beautifully see how these things actually translated into his clinical work. And for him, of course, we know that these things were intimately linked, right? He was like, to be a psychoanalytic practitioner was to be a revolutionary, because how do you imagine people's well-being if you're not being intimately linked up with fighting for their well-being in a very concrete way, right? So there was no separation for him. But one of the ones that I'm thinking about, um, I believe this was co-written with Abdullahi, was him sort of critiquing his own approach when he's working in an inpatient unit and he takes particular interest in the men in this unit and he's saying yeah what we did was basically this is this is to answer your idea about authority and how psychically it's it's right he understood what how authority is marked because basically what he had his staff do is everybody dressed the same there was no separation between how patients were marked and how staff or psychologists or psychiatrists were marked and his understanding was when you mark somebody, even through dress, right? And we can sort of take that back about when he marks the different berets, that's where it goes back to, right? He's like, you immediately have a signifier that says something more that allows the staff to sort of make associations psychically and affectively that would then cause certain hierarchies and certain actions in response to them consciously or unconsciously. So the first thing he does is say, everybody dresses the same. I don't want you to be able to clock who's a patient when you immediately walk into the space, right? But then in this beautiful paper, he critiques himself and he says, turns out that wasn't enough. Huh, imagine how these things work psychically not marking people wasn't enough because these things have a life of their own. So what he did is work with patients about, okay, what would it mean to have communal spaces? And his patients, particularly the men, ended up setting up um, cafes and card, like playing cards together. And that's what he located as a way of um, sort of overcoming the hierarchical process and then writing plays in this and the, the staff would act out the plays that the patients wrote right so there are all these ways in which he was beautifully playing with how do we understand that a hierarchy is here right even if the father dies the father is there right there has a particular place in the psychic history but then how do we disrupt that at every turn and how do we listen to people just like the father in a dying closing listens to the son and the daughter about what's ne what's actually needed for their own liberation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and great questions. There are great questions also in the chat. Um, one one um, about the status of um, the way Fanon engages the idea of the disabled militant or the sick militant and thinking about a kind of liberatory movement uh, in terms of, of disabled people. And I think that from Mark Sokolov, I think that what would be great is if we can return to these questions also at the end when we come back from breakout groups and move them into the breakout groups now so that we have some time in those smaller, more intimate architectures. Um, so thank you again so much. What we'll do now is we'll take a five minute break. So folks who are leaving and, and, and not coming back, that's great. You can go now. And if you stay, we're going to put you in a breakout group. So it's important in terms of getting the numbers right that only those who are staying uh, in the long term stay at this point. So five minutes would be, you know, uh, to 158 by my clock. Um, and we'll come right back and, and move into those groups. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Shia. Thank you.
So thank you so much. Um, as may have also been your experience just now, uh, Laura was about to respond to one of many, not the final part and question. And so I just actually wanted as a way of, of coming back together to let and ask Laura to, to start us there where Laura just was in thought. Um, so if, if Laura, if I don't, I've somehow lost Laura. Oh yeah, you're there on another screen. Yes. Uh, yeah, if we, if I can ask you to continue from whence we had just come. Sure. Let me put myself on gallery because I, I don't want to see my face centered <laughs> in all this. So here I am. Okay, so there were two things and I think they're linked up in some way. So there was a question about um, the gaze and how the white gaze is sort of um, ubiquitous and how do we create uh, possibilities of being and going on being and possibilities of life if we're constantly sort of under the scrutiny of that. And what I would say is that, you know, there's there's a way in which, of course, militancy and rethinking what militancy looks like. That's the other thing we talked about, like what are forms of militancy and what are forms of kinship, what are forms of locking up arms that may not sort of take away the surveillance of the gaze, but decenter it in a way where it's not always the relational reference point. And I think this is what we see in really in a dying colonialism where he's just like, this is not the fucking referential point that we're talking about. The referential point is here, right? So it's also thinking about how do we reconfigure what is central and what's periphery, right? And, and that brings in about gaze is what is, the cent what is our centrifugal force here? What's our center? And what's at the periphery? And that's, that's also a process of, of resisting normativity, right? Resisting sort of logics of oppression and disciplining a body in a particular way where we're always our, re our referential point is the white gaze. I mean, the surveillance is always there, right? But let me bring a, an example from Palestine in, and this is the sort of the decentering of the gaze is that uh, the surveillance state of, of what, is, what is now known as Israel is in many ways thought to be impenetrable, right? And then we have this beautiful example of the Freedom Tunnel, where five political prisoners used spoons to make their way out of what is thought to be the most fortified prison in the world, right? Under surveillance, I mean, these cameras, I, when you, there's nothing to kind of prepare you for how much under surveillance you feel. And surveillance, it's always there, but not there, because the way that watchtowers are set up, you can't see who's in there, but you know they're always watching, right? And Eyal Weitzman talks about this in terms of the architecture, right, of apartheid and surveillance. But what's amazing about that as an example of decentering the gaze, it's not like those prisoners, like, you know, did away with the surveillance. But what they did was, what is possible even within the surveillance? And it's not about how we, the gaze is partially also about what we constitute as successes, right? What we, and what we constitute as failures, because that is also inscribed within a particular gaze and a particular idea of what productive resistance looks like, for example. And what, the, what their sense is, and when you hear them speak, and especially in Arabic, they were just like, those, a lot of people might think and say, well, after five days, the, the last of them got caught and was re-incarcerated um, and actually have been doubly punished for even daring to resist, um, not a surprise. One of, one of them, the, his brother was killed, which goes back to a question we talked about the fracturing of the family, right? It's, there's a collective punishment of, if you do something, then the family becomes a target as well, shows us also, that colonialism is not confused about the of what the family represents in the collective struggle, right, to go after it. But what they said was, it doesn't matter that I'm back in here. I got to see Palestine for five days. I got to see the sky. I got to see the trees. I got to see the rocks. And that's a beautiful example of a reworking of that gaze. The referential point is not what constitutes success and freedom in the context of the colonial mind, but rather of the indigenous mind that says my link to this land and these five days where I got to breathe this air 
We're worth everything. And psychically, you can't take that away from me, right? That's a sort of, that would be one way I would think about a restructuring of um, our idea about the gaze, which links into, and then hopefully we can come back to the larger group, but Hannah had a sort of idea about symptoms under colonialism and how when like after colonialism, symptoms change and symptoms change pretty quickly, right? And then also the radio. And I think these things go hand in hand, right? The radio at Radio Algier is a part of dying colonialism has a chapter on Radio Algier, right? And part of it is when it's pumped in, this idea of the voice of the Algerian being pumped in, what can we think of also as restructuring psychically that you have a direct connection to a narrative and, and, and a, a direct connection to the militancy that's happening that's not um, recalibrated by the colonial narrative of what's happening. And that was pumped directly into the home. So you no longer have to sort of wait to hear or reinterpret messaging from the state, but rather it was pumped into the home in a new way of intimacy with the struggle, whether or not you were in the street, there was an intimacy of the struggle and a collapse of those boundaries between being in the street and not being in the street, which, which is really important also for thinking about, again, the ableist notion of action. Mm -hmm. like it's not about being in necessarily an embodied form in the street. It's also about imagining and sort of being in solidarity psychically as much as physically in the street. And this is where at the very least, this is the, the symptom piece and, and then I'll stop talking, um, is that at the most simple level, if we do away with colonialism and settler colonialism, the etiology of symptoms become more clear. But when settler colonialism and colonialism are present, there is no way that we can't link them up, right? Because settler colonialism and colonialism work so intimately with patriarchy, with sexism, with ableism, with homophobia, with transphobia, with queerphobia, with all the things that actually are, that colonialism shores up. If we were to dismantle that, the symptomatology and what is at the root cause becomes more clear. When settler colonialism is there, that's a far more complex question, the foremost of which settler colonialism is the end. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you also for returning us to, to the round of questions one. Um, so again, we have about 20 minutes uh, before we will um, stop for today. So just if, folks have more that came up in their groups that they'd like to tell the larger group um, or lingering questions or, or you know, points that were exciting, please feel free. And either in chat again or with raising hands. Um, Zoe. Um. Thank you as always, Lara. Um, I think what we spent a lot of time talking about, um, and I really appreciated it, and it's and it's been what has been troubling my readings of Fanon as of late, um, is thinking about the ways that the state inevitably captures these revolutionary reorganizations that are happening through the revolution. And we were kind of thinking, you know, is the reorganization that's happening and the, the gestures towards new liber liberatory socialities, like, is that more revolutionary than the outcome? Um, because we were just thinking about, for example, um, the, the history and the trajectory of China um, and the various revolutions that have come out of it and the ways that, you know, Chinese people have been so deeply traumatized um, in both family units and, and kind of collectively and the ways that that trauma becomes um, impenetrable. Um, and also thinking about, you know, the ways that the revolution inevitably gets captured by the state. Um, and so thinking about like with Zimbabwe and um, uh, Terence Ranger's idea of patriotic history, the revolution, what is revolutionary and so is transgressive as it is unfolding, becomes this new hegemony. Um, and, and so whatever family, whatever units um, emerge out of it, whether it's the family, whether it's the party, whether it's the comrade, 
um, becomes affixed into this new national structure, which then becomes its own, um, you know, kind of oppressive regime. And so we were just kind of thinking about Fanon's narrative position, whether it's this kind of um, aspiration, whether it's this kind of raw narration of what's happening um, and how we can kind of situate that into what, how we've seen history unfold. Um, it was, it was very interesting and very, and very challenging in like really generative ways, I think. I love that. And I love that because it also pushes up against this sort of, and, and many of you might have encountered this, where there's this like notion of needing to make Fanon everything we need him to be, and he can be anything at all times, and, you know, um, he, he, there's some answers he didn't give us and like we don't that he doesn't need to be that for us right including now he has clues he, he warns us of the local elites he warns us of how colonialism then resets up and by the way for the clinicians in the group that includes us <laughs> that we become the primary ways that the state works in this way that you're talking about Zoe Right. And, and that's in the state capture, of course, on comrades in South Africa. Right. What does it mean to like, right, to have state capture in this particular way? And I think that if we can let go of the fantasy and the, maybe the libidinal charge of Fanon being everything we need him to be, then it frees us up also to extrapolate the warnings, but also a particular type of logic where we can come to expect this, where his chapter on violence is just as applicable to post-colonialism post as it is, right? A turning in on itself, that it's sort of like, this never ends. That's, and that's why I love thinking about Fanon as a process. He, he, clinically speaking, he offers us a process comment, not a concrete, right? And if we're thinking about process, it's a never ending process of this turbulence so that we're not, because the forces of these logics are so embedded that of course they're going to recapitulate themselves and recalibrate themselves constantly because that's what power does, right? So perhaps the biggest thing for me, that's what I take from him is a reminder that there is no rest, right? It's not an end point. It's a process that is continuous in a renegotiation, which includes also an expansiveness of what we understand that needs to be included in our auto critique, that needs to be included in our struggles and who were this imagining in those struggles at all times also? And who do we sort of prioritize? I mean, this is sort of like a tongue in cheek response to this is this is sort of like moving from a, like a white anarchist position of like, well, why are you fighting for the nation state? I'm like, let fucking Palestine fight for the nation state. And once it's there, then we'll come after the local elites about the nation state and how it looks like, right? That there's, there's a specificity to that fight and then there's a promise of what comes after, because we know how these things repeat themselves over and over again. And of course, in different guises, in different ways. Um, but so I, I love that that's, that's where you all went. And there's a lot in the chat of this kind of question came up in our group too. And so I also wanna invite if other inflections of that question, or if people wanna have respond from those conversations, please, we can keep going. Can I just note that my last answer about Fanon being everything is also a response to Alex. Alex from Sheffield, if you're in Sheffield, if you're here now, that is, you know, when you're saying a critique of early Fanon, I tend to work a, away from that because I'm not understanding him as, you know, everything. I'm not trying to make him everything I need him to be in that particular moment. Right. It's it is a, a beautiful way to see his own evolution and also his failures and his limitations about how to think about things. And also so compressed because he died so, so young. You know, the changes between the texts are enormous and yet just 18 months apart, you know, one right after the other. I mean, perhaps that's a commentary also on what it means to be a revolutionary militant. I mean, the change is also that he became a gun runner. <laughs> you know, it wasn't it wasn't by chance 
that there's this sort of intimate knowledge of what it actually looks like and what it means. And again, in his clinical writing, he lays it out very clearly for us about that there is no separation between those things, that his lending his um, body to the fight was a central piece of him being a psychoanalytic practitioner. I don't know if I can put this well, but I'm just thinking about the the questions of trauma and violence that also came up in our um, in our group discussion. I'm thinking about um, I, the country that I was born in, which is China, where the response to violence and trauma isn't to sort of make people more anarchist or more, I suppose, communist or like more willing to sort of think about and find new creative solutions or negotiate positions. It is to make people respond in a very Hobbesian way, like run for shelter, you know, who can save me from the violence. And so that's part of my, I mean, on the one hand, I tend to see traumas coming from within that, and part of the trauma is being unable to create connections. And part of the response is being able to sort of foster those connections. But on the other hand, I'm also just wondering, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I wonder if, if there's a way in which a militant response almost inevitably leads to, um, I mean, if, if it is going to be a cycle, you know, where on the one hand, there's a sort of a breakthrough of the current structures, a, a sense of possibility. On the other hand, a capture maybe by the state, but also the state is coming from the people. I mean, this, the, even by the state in the name of the people, but even by the people who subscribe to the powers of the state. I mean, for me, the deeply aggravating thing about China is that for the most part, the people that I know of, that I'm in touch with, despite their education, despite their training, are deeply sort of um, like, I mean, they, they validate the state. So, I mean, there, there's a way in which the state's narrative about the separation, about it sort of uh, speaks for the will of the people is actually validated by the people that's speaking for, which makes it very hard for me to say, no, that's the external state versus like the people that it's, you know, that that's le le leveraging over. So I'm, I, I suppose part of my suspicion of a sort of a militant response is what if that is a cycle that it drives, that, that it inevitably drives in one way or another? Like, is there really a way out of that? Thank you so much for that. Um, in many ways, what you're naming for me is a, a logic of conscription right, about how the state in various forms, ideologically, and then of course, economically, socially, relationally, politically, conscripts people into a particular, um, also violence, right? Now, of course, the, the power of the state is, is concrete, but there's a, there is a conscription of people, just like there's a conscription of people into white supremacy to sort of for the viability of white supremacy, just like the viability of the state, right? Um, and so when you talk about like, is this a cycle that we can break? For me, I'm, I'm not gonna be arrogant enough to say, I know the answer of how to break that. What I do know is that I need to be in struggle to believe that that is a cycle that can be broken. Right, because if I don't, if I'm not, and this is the part I think this is where it links into Fanon is this alienation, right? Is that alienation is the way and perhaps the method and the channel by which people are conscripted. Because when you feel alienated, then you're also much more likely to sort of um, rely on a state narrative or that. And that's not in a victim blaming way, that's actually a constitutive part psychically of the way that state capitalism works, the way that um, capitalism in general works, the way the racial hierarchy works. And so the, the only way to break that cycle for me is a consistent everyday negotiation of my part in an active struggle against alienation. The way personally I find my way into that is community and solidarity and Dream, this is why I, I really have immersed myself in abolitionist literature, right? Not just about the necessity of breaking down the walls of prisons, but also how do I relate and enact in everyday life and everyday relationships, the imaginary, the future imaginaries, the relationships that I want the world to look like, 
And that's a daily thing that I'm engaged in to hopefully resist the capture, state capture and otherwise that comes with alienation. I will say that Robin D.G. Kelly has been a central voice in that. And how he speaks about what it means to be in solidarity. I mean, he's one of many voices, but for me, it's just personally just touches so much. What it means to be in solidarity, what it means when solidarity, he has uh, the line that he says, solidarity is not a market exchange. What does it mean when solidarity is reimagined outside the confines of what, of the channels of the state, right? And I think that is an active struggle that we're all a part of. And it's the only thing that is a life-sustaining force for me to, to, to hopefully disrupt the very important cycle that you're saying. Clinically, I would say one more thing. I think our reliance on the category of trauma is also very problematic because there's a way in which trauma becomes legible only in a particular way, which is a, a victimization rather than as an empowerment and as a means also of collective solidarity against alienation. Right? And, and that's of course supported politically, economically, um, and through a coloniality of being too. Seth, if you wanna go ahead. Um, yeah, gosh, this is all, this is so fascinating. Um, and I mean, the question that I had in the breakout room, we had, we had a really wonderful conversation about it. And um, Zoe was such a great um, steward of the, of the conversation, but um, is, is sort of one about how, these forms of this bad cyclicality relates to or can relate to at least what I I think some of us are, are hoping is a good or productive cyclicality of analysis of psychoanalysis. Um, you know, specifically the, you know, I mean, an analysis is a clinical clinically protected space or certainly certainly regulated space of endless alienation. Um, you know, but it's also the place where it's, it's, and I want to think obviously capaciously about that clinical space. I mean, that clinical space is happening all the time in a way, everywhere in mass and individual ways, just very badly. Um, but, uh, you know, analysis should be a place where one learns that one's fantasies about the state are stand on nothing, you know? Um, so um, I just, I just wonder if, but also analysis can be a place where, you know, you, you work through your stuff and realize you actually want to be, you know, a revolutionary and a militant. And, you know, you want to advocate not least for various forms of insurrectionary or insurgent sort of violence. Um, anyway, I just wonder if people have thoughts about linking up these two forms of good and maybe, maybe good and certainly bad cyclicality. That's an awesome question. And please, I'd invite others of you who've thought through this to, to, to join in in this answer. Um, I, you know, I wanna live in the world that you live in where psychoanalysis has that, <laughs> that result. <laughs> that is the, that's the dream, <laughs> right? Um, I think the only way that I can see psychoanalysis as, as, as doing that and I think is if it relinquishes its fantasy of being the site of revolution, it can be a one of many tools that people use, but if it continuously looks at itself as the site of revolution, that will never happen because to be the site of revolution, you are also disciplining people in a particular way. And if we're thinking about what Fanon is talking about, you're also staying revolutionary fire, right? Um, and, this is the part where the confusion mongering piece of on violence comes in the in wretched of the earth right and the the cry to clinicians particularly like you become confusion mongers and what does that mean in my mind is about the the questions that get asked as a constitutive part of psychoanalytic technique and practice not as an accident right as an ideological position that has people question when they actually start to feel disalienated, we help them become even more alienated, right? By what? By prioritizing 
time and slowness and thinking, all of which, by the way, is a colonial method also of thinking who's a thinking and speaking subject. And by prioritizing speech, of course, <laughs> right, as a way in which action and psycho and these cyclical things happen, right? That has a sordid colonial racist history too, about who has an interiority, who speaks, who's a speaking subject, who's allowed to, who's allowed to speak to these things. And then of course, what are the fantasies of revolution that I have? And what does that mean for the psychoanalyst in terms of their position in that new social order? That's why it can't be the site of revolution. I don't believe psychoanalysis can be the site of revolution, but it can be a continuous process of what Martin Baro or what Fanon might say as a, as a place and a space of a working through of disalienation, a series of that that has to be matched with other things. And what I would say to the clinicians is the room is the arrogance that that happens only in your 45 minute or 50 minute session. <laughs> Right, which is the way also how our fee structures are set up, the way that everything is like there, that it must be matched up with everything else that is life sustaining to sustain this alienation so that that space, that relational space that we're constantly working through does become revolutionary and not a staying of revolutionary fire. Thanks, that's great. Thank you. And though it's, of course, like heartbreaking to end, I think that's a really profound place to stop. Um, I want to just thank you again so much and welcome others to join me in thanking you uh, for giving us this time to think together and to think with you, learn from you, as always. And two weeks from today, well, we'll hear Fakhri Davids present on Klein and Winnicott. And I encourage you all again to join us and to RSVP and to come and to participate how it's feeling good, whether in breakout rooms or not. And um, the readings are there in the Dropbox as always, the link will be the same. And um, thank you so much again, Laura. Thank, thank you, you all for coming on a Sunday. Yes, and see thank you, you all for your generosity. I so appreciate it.